right, well, good morning. Oh, man. Second service. Y'all have already had three cups of coffee. Y'all have had breakfast. Some of y'all have done laundry. So y'all are, uh, y'all should be pumping going. Here we go. Good morning. There we go. There we go. We're live. We got, we got to pull it. Sorry. My name is Walt Tanner, one of the pastors here at Capstone. And, and like Anna said, um, Awanataz means a lot to a lot of us who, who have grown up in this area. I went there when I was 15 years old. Uh, so 25 years ago. Now my son is going as a middle schooler. Um, some of you guys know this. Some of you don't. Uh, when I was a, a senior at Clemson University, I went into a fall retreat with this guy named Chris Barino. I uh, did not know him. I met him. Uh, God knew that eight years later that we'd plant a church together and um, that ultimately I didn't know them that I would be a pastor. So you never know what God is doing, whether there is a middle schooler, a high schooler who's gonna be a church planner or whether there were some college students there or we were gonna plant other churches or whether there's gonna be people. Um, God, and that's the beauty of how God works. You never know how he is, what he is doing now is going to prepare you for what he has in the future. And that's ultimately what this whole series has been about. The idea of thriving in Babylon is that God is connecting dots. And, and even though Daniel, who's a captive, who's taken from his nation of Israel and is now a captive of the Babylonian empire, he didn't know that when he was a teenager that God would use him for decades for his glory. And that right now you might be hurting and right now you might feel like a captive to an addiction or you might feel captive in a marriage or you might feel like there's no way God could use you because of what's going on in your life. Can I tell you that God already has a plan that if you're faithful and you listen and you take those steps of obedience and you have what we've been talking about, the humility and the wisdom and the hope, not in this world, but of in Christ, that God is going to use you ultimately for his glory. And last week we looked at this idea of humility in Babylon is that throughout the consistency of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel, that even though they were living in a pagan nation, that they continue to operate in humility. They continue to operate in humility. And, and ultimately we've talked about here in America that right now humility is seen as more of a weakness. It's a weakness and, and even in the church it's a weakness because if someone doesn't think like us or they, they vote different than us or they don't, uh, they don't respect our view of scripture or the way we view family, family values, that instead of listening and instead of humbly uh, listening to what they have or, or even just kind of going, hey, let's agree to disagree, we take our ball and we go home. And ultimately, if we're going to thrive in Babylon, it, remember that we're living in a post-Christian society, which means we're, we're going to probably lose some battles when it comes to quote unquote church rights, that we don't have a seat at the table of influence in our culture because a majority of our nation is not making decisions differently because of Jesus. By the way, that's how we decide whether you're a disciple or not. You're going, hey, are you making decisions differently because of Christ? And more than just Sunday morning, but the idea of how you parent and the idea that you deal with your weekends and how you spend your money and, and the way that you use your time, is it different because of Jesus? Or are you just making decisions like your lost neighbor? And so last week we said that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they humbly um, disagree with the king. When the king says, hey, you need to bow down to my statue, they say, you know what? Our God tells us in Exodus 20, that we're gonna take a stand and he says not to worship any other gods. And we said that when we take a stand, it isn't a political stand we should take, it should be a biblical stand. And now sometimes those things get intertwined in politics, but a lot of times we get caught up more in the idea of, well, this party thinks this way and this party thinks that way. Can I tell you, they're not political issues, they're biblical issues of whatever stand that you decide to take. But that we should do that in a humble manner, which means when we take a stand, it should draw those who are far from the Lord, they should go, man, you know what? I respect your views of that, even though we can agree to disagree, but it draws them closer versus when we respond in pride, which is what a lot of us do. So we do in the church that, that our, we look like the world, our hearts get hardened. We don't have mercy. We don't have grace. We don't have compassion. We just go, I can't believe you would think that way. I can't believe you would vote that way. I can't believe, you know what, because of that, I'm not going to talk to you. Because of that, I'm not going to have you over for dinner. Because of that, we can't be friends. What's it like to have biblical humility and show people compassion, to show people grace, to allow them to, to even be against you and you still love them and serve them and listen to them? And last week we saw that, that they, they disrespect, they get thrown in the fiery furnace. God shows up literally in the form of a, th of a fourth person in the fire and, and Nebuchadnezzar goes, man, your God is awesome, calls them out. And we see that a pagan king goes, man, I want to know more about your God. 
Now, we know that Nebuchadnezzar ultimately is all about himself and it's shown in the next chapter. I was gonna try to summarize chapters four and five for you, but we have run out of time and there's no way I can do that because we don't wanna be here for another two hours. So let me quickly summarize for chapter four. Chapter four, King Nebuchadnezzar, remember he's the king of the Babylonians. He has a dream and ultimately he calls Daniel. says, Daniel, what's my dream mean? He says, basically, if you don't give God credit for giving you this kingdom, you're gonna go cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. He's like, no, nah, there's no way. So he kind of forgets a year goes by and then he goes on rooftop and he looks at all the beautiful things he's created. And he says this in, in uh, Daniel 4 uh, in verse 30. He says, is this great Babylon that I have built, that, that is my might and power and is about my majesty? So he looks out and goes, but Daniel says in chapter one, verse two, that God had handed Israel over to Babylon and that actually God had, had, had risen this pagan king to do his bidding. That God had used someone who doesn't believe in him. God was using someone who was evil. God was using someone who was far from him. Yet Daniel says, hey, if you don't, if you don't recognize that God's giving you this, you're gonna go crazy. Long story short, he goes crazy. He actually, he grows hair. He go, I mean, he, they put him out in the, in the wilderness and he has to, he eats leaves and roots and goes crazy. Ultimately, God lifts that off and, and he gives glory to God in the end. Then in chapter five, a new king is there. Daniel's about, he's in his 70s or 80s. And there's a famous story about the handwriting on the wall. They're, they're, they're literally having a party as pagans do. We'll keep it PG because I know we have our uh, camp rockers in here, but they are having a pagan filled party. And all of a sudden this hand shows up and starts writing on the wall. They call Daniel in. Daniel, dude, what's this mean? And they say, hey, king, which by the way, the king thinks very highly of himself. He thinks there's no way that he could ever be conquered. He says, hey, tonight you die and the Babylonian empire will be shut off. He's like, no way. There's no way anybody's gonna come in here and take over my kingdom. What they don't know is that the Medes and Persians are literally outside the walls. The next morning, the king is found dead. His throat was slit. The Medes and Persians have come in and now they are the big kid on the block, all right? So they are now the empire that is ruling. So that's what we're gonna start today. We're gonna be in Daniel chapter six. Camp Rockers, if you're hanging out with us, uh, for our Camp Rockers who are first through fifth, we're really excited. As Brett said, in two weeks, we're gonna be starting that back up um, over for our, our Capstone kids. But if you're keeping track, we're in Daniel six. We're gonna be going from verses five to 20 on your soap sheets. So here's what it is. Now there's this guy named King Darius. I was going to take a picture up there, have Darius Rucker with a, uh, with a crown on him because that's all I could think about every time I say King Darius is Darius with his guitar uh, and he's the king. So King Darius is now the king of the Medes and the Persians, which is historic. We know that there is a, there is a, there is a conquering empire that came after the Babylonian empire. But just like everybody else, he's looked at Daniel and go, man, there's something special about you. And there's been favor and there's humility in Daniel and there's wisdom in him. And so he goes, hey, I want you to be over. Long story short, he is over. There's three guys over the entire empire. He's one of them. Well, the other guys are like, we need to get rid of this dude and let's just not get him out of his position. Let's kill him. So that's kind of what the story is about today. So let's figure out a way that we can kill him. They say that we can't figure our way at him. So let's read uh, Daniel 6, verse five. So they said this in verse five, then these men, we shall find, we cannot, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless it is in connection with the law of his God. So I know all of us and those on watching who are watching online and those of us in here that we have been watching. There are a few political ads on my TV right now, right? I mean, literally it's back to back to back to back and they contradict one another. Why? Because they're pulling up dirt on all these guys. They're pulling up dirt on these women. They're pulling up all these politicians and, and they're bringing out all the skeletons in the closet. Well, that's what they were trying to do with Daniel, but they couldn't find any dirt on him. They couldn't find anything that, that they could use against him in a political, ah, there's nothing that they could use against him to get him ousted. They said, if we're going to use something against him, he doesn't have any temptations. He doesn't have any vices. He doesn't have anything. So if we're gonna use something against him, it's gonna have to be about his God because he is so faithful to his God. I was talking to a, a guy and we were kind of having a conversation just about some stuff and, and I talked about being above reproach. And he's like, what does that mean? He doesn't go to church. Because what does above reproach mean? And it's a biblical term that basically means that when people look at you, they can't find anything to use against you. They can't use anything. They go, man, yeah, because he has this, he has this addiction or he has this, that he seems to be above reproach. Even if people want to talk bad about him, they can't. And it's one of the goals of my life that I tried that in the end, I hopefully people go, man, that Walt Tanner is above reproach and, and errors. Now, am I perfect? No, far from it. 
But it's a standard that I have. And, and here's a question I have and a challenge for you of what is your standard of living? Is it to be above reproach that when people look at your life, they go, man, they are living a life that is righteous. And if we're gonna find any dirt on him, it's gonna have to be about how he worships and how he lives and his stance of scripture. Or is your standard your neighbor? You go, well, I'm not as bad as he is. I'm not as bad as she is. What is your standard that you, you live? Is it like Daniel, that, that's one that's gonna bring honor and glory and that you'll be above reproach? Remember, it's just not about not being bad and going to church. It's that that righteousness causes you to stand out. Does your righteousness cause you to stand out? Now, if you're here and you're not a Christ follower, first of all, we're glad that you're here. We, we never assume that everybody here has been to church or grew up in church, but we wanna tell you that, man, the, the idea that, that being a Christian is not just about being good. Because being a Christ follower isn't about being good. It's about being holy. And that we do that by following Christ. So they, these guys go to King Darius and say, hey, Darius. And they knew Darius had a, he had a, he had a vice. It was his ego. He, probably pretty, he, he was king. He thought high of himself. So he said, hey, king, we believe that, that, that you're awesome. And there should be such, you're such awesome is that we think that no one should pray to anybody else other than you for the next 30 days. The king goes, you know what? I like where you're going with this. Keep going. And not only should they pray to you and not pray to anybody other, if they break that, they need to go into the lion's den. He goes, okay, let's do this. 30 days about me. I like it. Some of you, that's y'all's birthday month. Like for the entire month, it's all about you. You're like, you know what, where I want to eat, what I want to do. So he goes, 30 days worshiping me. This is what we're going to do. So they do that. And then in verse, um, verse 10, we see Daniel's response. So when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, so once King Darius signs this, he can't go back on it. He, this, is, this was his response. And this has been our big idea. What will our response be when you get the call from the doctor? What will be your response it be when uh, you don't get into that college? What will your response be when you find out that you're not pregnant again this month? What will your response be when you find out bad news? Let's see what his response is. He went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and he prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. So as he had done previously, that's gonna come back into play in a second. So he goes, he goes up to his, his, his penthouse and he's like, you know, I've, I've been doing this long enough now. And he had windows and he kept the windows open. And, and, and so your first point is this, is that courage is about doing what is right. Courage to do what is right. So today's all about courage in Babylon. And this, as we, as we land the plane of, of thriving in Babylon, is that we have courage. So he heard this, this document was coming in and he knew that the king couldn't go back on it. So his response isn't to close the gate, I mean, close the window. So the people who are hating on him, because haters are gonna hate, just FYI. Haters are gonna hate. If, if things is, are working forward, they're gonna hate on you. And so he's like, I can make, at least make them do some investigative work to find me. He says, nah. I'm going to keep doing what I've always been doing. And, and you know what? It, wherever this lands me, I have the courage to do what is right. And so when we live in a Babylon, do we have the courage to do what is right? Do we have the courage of Daniel? So here's my kind of, uh, here's, here's my definition of courage. If, if you're kind of writing things down, taking notes, that courage is pressing forward, even though it may cause suffering. So courage is pressing forward, even when it may cause suffering. So the idea of a fireman, that they have courage. Why? Because they run into a burning building and they may be suffering. They could get burned. They could, get, uh, they, could get, uh, they could die. Or the idea of the courage to jump into a river to save someone who is drowning. Why? Because you might drown trying to save someone. That's how we define courage. Courage is the idea that it, it, it might cost you something. So here's another question. If you're new to Capstone, we try to give you what we call application. It's just not reading the Bible and go, oh, I learned a lesson, but that idea of application. So here's a challenge for you. What, is, what, is, what does courage look like in your life? What is it that you're risking that might cause something, again, for Christ? What does that look like in your life? Are we just kind of on cruise control and, and following Jesus really doesn't cost you anything? Jesus would say, actually, it should cost you everything. The idea that I'm faithfully following him and I'm sacrificing the things of this world so I can, again, reflect his goodness, not about my righteousness. So they see Daniel praying continuously as he always had done, because they knew that. Is if we're gonna find anything wrong with him, it's gonna be in his faithfulness. So they run to King Darius. Hey, King Darius, remember your boy? Because by the way, Darius was, was drinking the Kool-Aid of Daniel. So he was all about Daniel. So he had always been drinking the Kool-Aid. And then they say, hey, your boy Daniel... 
remember that law you signed? He's like, yeah, it, it was 30 days of me. Let's do it. He goes, well, your boy Daniel, he's praying to his God. And I imagine Darius just kind of his head sinking into his hands, shaking his head because he knew what had happened. They had used his vices against him and his ego to hurt a friend, a confidant, a leader. So when he trusted, but now he was gonna have to throw him into the lion's den. He knew that he had been played. He knew that he'd been played. So let's see what happens in verse 16. Verse 16 says this, let me flip over. It says, then the king, king commanded and Daniel was brought and cast into the lion's den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you, exclamation point. So he's screaming that. He is telling him as he goes into there, I hope your God delivers you, 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 you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet and the signet of the Lord's and nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. So he basically says, guess what? Big boy, you can't leave here until the seal is broken. Now, when we read the Old Testament, we always need to be looking for Jesus, all right? If you're new to reading the Bible, the Bible, it has an Old Testament and New Testament and they're not two separate books. They work together. That everything happens in the Old Testament is pointing to a coming king named Jesus, Messiah. And everything Jesus happens in Jesus in the New Testament is pointing back to the Old Testament. So when you read this, you should always be reading, oh man, where's the picture of Jesus in this? And just like Jesus's tomb, they put a stone over it. And just like Pontius Pilate seals that tomb, we see this tomb of Daniel sealed. That we see a picture of what should be death, but ultimately it's gonna be a story of life. So we see this played out and the stones placed over the lion's den and the idea that it wasn't Daniel who says, hey, my God's gonna do something awesome. It's King Darius, because man, your God that you prayed to, I hope he's gonna save you and redeem you because you're my friend. I, I look up to you, man. And, and man, I hope your God does good. If you keep reading, it says that he actually loses sleep that night. He can't eat, that the sun, that, uh, the sunrise, that he runs to the tomb again. A lot like that Easter morning where Mary and Mary are running back to the tomb. But when they get to the tomb, there's no rock over it and it's no longer sealed and it's empty. But the king runs and he finds the stone still there. So he knows it's not gonna be good. And this is what it says in verse 20. It says, as he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. So when you watch the Middle Eastern and you see something happen in Israel or you see something happen in Iran or you see something happen in Pakistan or, or Libya or somewhere like that, you see when a child is killed, you see mothers screaming and you see guys ripping their shirts. That's the type of anguish that King Darius brings so he's coming and he's probably been weeping all night and his eyes are swollen and, and his friend that he did not want to put in the lions and he had to put in there. It says he comes back with anguish in verse 20 and it says, he says, oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? And then Daniel responds. And I'm gonna read kind of a, um, a paraphrase from the commentary that one of the commentaries I studied in this because I think it's just so good. This is kind of a, a, a verse 21 through 22. He says, good morning, my king. I hope you're going well with you that you enjoyed a good night's sleep. <laughs> I sure did. I slept like a little lamb with your lions as my guest. Their, pur their quiet purring put me right to sleep and their warm bodies and fur kept me from even a cold night. Such sweet, cute cats. That's not true. We all know that if cats are bigger than you, they'll eat you. All right. So, oh, I have a very special guest to show up. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth. That's verse 22. Why? Did, they didn't even get a lick from their tongue, not one. They haven't harmed me. They did not touch one gray hair on my head. Of course, you should know the reason. So let me tell you why. He says, I honor my God and I did, I did nothing wrong to be put in here. I, I, the whole situation was in his hands of my true king. And this is what he did. I trusted him. Either way, and I'll continue to do so. As long as I live, now, would you like to come down and join me? He doesn't, because that's crazy talk. Uh, he lifts him up, and he says, Daniel, gives him embrace, hugs him, says, man, they, they bro hug. And he's like, man, I'm so glad that you're good. He's like, hey, let's bring those, joke, those haters over here. So he says, hey, haters, I need you guys to come over here. I need you to look in there. And as soon as he looks in there, they bring their families over too, and they shove them all into the lion's den, and they all die judgment of the king. 
He says, don't play me like that again. And to show you that you don't play a king like that, I am going to destroy you and your entire families. And by the way, if anybody talks bad about the God of Daniel, you will be thrown into this lion's den. So what do we take away from this story? Well, ultimately, we've got to know is that Daniel's courage, again, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's courage led someone who doesn't necessarily believe in God, who is godless, go, man, your God is awesome. Now, are there people in your lives who don't go to church and, and you share stories or you share a, a, a testimony or you share something about church, you go, man, you know what? I don't go to church, but man, this God you talk about, it seems legit. Again, one of, the, one of the greatest privileges that and, and Betsy have had, and we've had lots of people that we've shared the gospel with, but, but one specific neighbor who said, I don't go to church. She didn't believe in God. She said, I don't go to church, but if I did, I would go to your church. Because the way you treat me, the way that you listen, the way that even though we don't agree politically, even though we don't agree on, on, on core values of life, man, I, I, what you do and, and how you serve, I, I'd go to your church if I ever went to a church. One of the greatest compliments I've ever received of, of our Capstone family because she also knew some of you guys and you guys spent time with her and you, they really go, man. So what does that look like in your life that when people who are far from the Lord and tragedy comes, do you, will they see your courage? People who don't talk like you, live like you. Because in our modern day Babylon, in order to thrive in Babylon, we have to have courage of going, why is your marriage different? Why is the way that you spend money different? Why are your vacations so different? Why is it that your life looks so different? And we have to have the courage of going, well, let me tell you why. Because I believe in a risen Savior. Hey, let me tell you why I was once lost and I am found. Hey, I was once dead and now I am alive. My marriage used to be just about, just about us being happy. And now my marriage is about us being holy. You know, I used to just think it was about raising kids to be successful adults. And now I realize it's, it's about raising kids for eternity. And so that's why we have to have courage in order to thrive in Babylon. This isn't just an Old Testament deal, but going to New Testament, this guy named Paul wrote to the church of Corinth and he said this, and this is a New Living Translation. I just felt like this was a better translation than our normal ESV. It says, be on guard, stand firm in the faith. And what? Be courageous, be strong. He says, be courageous, be strong. So your next point is this, is courage takes intentional action. It takes in intentional action. The idea that you, would, that, that you would stand guard and the idea that you would be firm in your faith. Um, the commentator, another, he says this, and this is really important, everybody listen. Christian character is not forged in the moment of adversity. Christian character is revealed in that moment of adversity. So the idea of when, when adversity comes, when trials come, when, when, when things come, when that phone call from the doctor comes, when the boss calls you in, whatever that's going on in your life, the adversity doesn't give you that character. It's revealed in that adversity. So Daniel didn't get courage because he went into the lion's den. Daniel had courage because what did it say? Continuously, he had prayed three times a day for years and decades in that window. He had prayed daily, three times a day. He had been in the, the scripture. He had been in the scrolls. He had known all those things. And so the, ultimately, a lot of us go, well, you know, if I had need to, to be courageous, then I would. Can I tell you, courageous acts come from simply standing strong daily, being on guard daily, living a life of faith daily. That's how we work our, our, our faith muscles. That's how you become strong. That's how you become courageous. It's not the idea that in a moment you're going to become cur courageous. No, it's that every single day you take one step closer and one step closer and one step closer to when you look back and you go, man, I can't believe that I am taking this stand today because 10 years ago, I never would have been able to share that gospel. I never would have been able to quote a Bible verse. I would have never gone to Haiti. I never would have adopted. I never would have been a mentor. I never would have given away 20% of our year's income to, to, the, to the least of these. There's no way I would have ever done that. Every single day, we did, lived in faith and we were, we were uh, understanding that we were on guard. And that allowed us to build those courageous, strong muscles and so as we see that, the king is astonished. Oh man, your God is so good. So what does that look like in your life? And Joshua, uh, Joshua 1, 6 says this. 
He tells basically Joshua is the leader of the, uh, of the nation of Israel as they go into the promised land. Joshua 1, 6, and God says, hey, you need to be strong and courageous. Strong and courageous. I don't know if any of you watch the um, men's g- devotional, what we call the Garage Deep Dive. It's on our app. We encourage you to do that. And it's why we've been giving you those daily little pieces of, of goodness. That's why we've given you the ga- gathering insights on the app and the men's devotionals and women's devotional. The, the idea is that you're able to daily grow in your strength. You're daily growing and courageously. But my father-in-law, Butch, he, he, he quoted this verse. Didn't know I was gonna preach on it. I didn't know he was gonna talk about it. But, it, but I, I believe the Lord is, is faithful that he's reminding us to be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. The Lord didn't say be studious in debate. The Lord didn't say hide in fear. He says be courageous. Now, when he says be courageous, it, can I tell you it's not for your glory? It's not for your, you. It's for the least of these. It's for those who are lost and they need to be found. It's for those who are dead and need to be made alive. It's for the orphan, the widow, the outcast, the immigrant, those who can't speak for themselves the hurting, the broken. That when God says, hey, I need you to be strong and courageous, it's not so people think you're righteous. It's not so people think that you're holy. It's so that you can, you can, you have the strength to pull people up. It's the strength, the idea of going, hey, I know that you're hurting right now. I know that past marriage really hurt you and you have scars. Can I tell you that I wanna lift you up in the name of Jesus? That, hey, I know that, that you feel abandoned right now, but in the name of Jesus, I was once abandoned too and he found me and I wanna help you out of that. But many of us just go to church. We carry our Bibles and we mark it off the list. We're not as bad as our neighbors. That's all we need. God says, I didn't redeem you just to cruise control through life. I redeemed you to be strong and courageous. I redeemed you to, be, to, to basically be my hands and feet and lift up those who are hurting, to lift up those in this broken and hopeless world to bring them hope. And here's your last point is this, is that courage will bear fruit. Courage or bear fruit. So the idea is that courage is to do what is right. Courage takes uh, intentional action. And when you do that, there's gonna be fruit. Hebrews 11, that's in the, the New Testament. We've studied that here at Capstone. We call Hebrews 11, the hall of fame of faith. And it lists out all these people who did these amazing things because they were strong and courageous, but God used them, men and women, to do amazing things. And verse 33, it doesn't say Daniel, but verse 33 says, who through faith stopped the mouths of lions. And it's people's stories who bore much fruit. But the last part of Hebrews 11 were the real heroes. The real heroes, because ultimately it says, there were those who were thrown into fire and they were burned up. There were those who were thrown in the lion's den and they were eaten up. There were those who were, who were saw in two. There were those who were stoned to death. There were those who were pierced with a sword and died. You see, their courage, even though God didn't, God, God didn't save them in their trials and tribulations, their courage is no different than Daniel's and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's. God just had a different plan. And, and when we talk about courage, courage doesn't mean that everything's going to be happily ever after. The idea of bearing fruit, again, is that others receive, that the people see the glory of the God through your actions is sometimes God's plan is to heal that person with cancer. Sometimes God's plan isn't. Sometimes it is that you get that job. Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes God has different plans and and the understanding that courage doesn't always mean that you get what you want because remember, courage isn't about your happiness, it's about his holiness. And then when people see that, even whether it's on this side of eternity or next, courage isn't about you getting what you want. Courage is about reflecting his goodness and his glory, whether on this side of eternity or next. Remember, it's a long road and we're gonna lose some battles along the way, but we've said throughout this whole series that God is victorious. Why? Because Jesus defeated Satan, sin, and death through the tomb that wasn't sealed anymore, but was empty. So we have to hold on to that, that no matter what our courage, and remember, courage is pressing forward even though it may cause suffering. Courage is pressing forward even though it may cause suffering. So if we're gonna thrive in Babylon, we have to have courage and it may not work out for us. We may lose a friend. We may not get that promotion. 
We may draw lines in the sand and not be conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And in Jesus, Romans 12, 1 and 2, and it might cost us something. You might not be invited to something. But ultimately, we have to have the courage wherever God's in that understanding. Having courage doesn't mean watering down the gospel. It doesn't mean to go, well, you know, you, you know if you think you get into heaven by worshiping another God, or, or the idea that, that, that our sins are totally forgiven only through Jesus, and not by our works. The good news is that, remember, Jesus lived a life that we couldn't, died to death that we should have, defeating Satan, sin, and death through his resurrection. We're not gonna water that down. The only way to heaven, John uh, 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, does everybody agree with that? No. But that's, a, that's, that's where we're gonna go. And we're gonna, we're gonna love them and we're gonna point people there and we're gonna listen to them and we're gonna, we're, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna say, hey, what does it mean to love? What does it mean to serve? What does it mean? Because even when we disagree with someone, the idea of going, we're still going to have mercy and grace and not get mad even if someone disagrees with us. If we're gonna thrive in Babylon. And so we move forward listening and loving and serving and be, hopefully drawing people in with the way that we live our life. So here's our big idea. If you're new to Capstone, we try to have a big idea of going, hey, here's our one takeaway. You can talk about at lunch. You can share with your grandma what you're work, learning, at, uh, learning at church, or you can share on social media. But simply this, Christian courage isn't about making a point. It's about responding in a way that points others to King Jesus. Having Christian courage and go, oh, look what I did. Look at the stance that I made. Look, I made this point. That's not what Daniel did. Daniel said, I worship my God, I worship my king. And to do it again, I'll do the same thing. It's not about me, it's about him. So how in your life are you taking risk? How in your life are you standing strong? How in your life are you reflecting and pointing others to him? Six weeks ago, we started this series and ultimately we said, it's not about what happens to you that shapes your identity. It's about how you respond that shapes your identity. We talked about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and understanding that, the, that their identity is in their response. And throughout this book, we have seen them go and respond and point others as an opportunity. And can I tell you, 2020 has been an opportunity to point others to Jesus. And some of you here are coming in and you've been hurt. Some of you are coming in and you're still full of anxiety and fear. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe your marriage is barely hanging on. Which, by the way, in two weeks, we're gonna be starting a marriage series. Maybe parenting has just seemed like this whole idea of e-learning and and the idea of your kids and not wanting to eat them and and getting rid of them like some primitive uh, animals do, going, man, I know why some apes eat their children because this is too much. I can't understand of of how to do this. And you're just gonna leave. You're like, nope, it's okay. And you get talked off the ledge. It's okay. We all have to get talked off the ledge sometimes. But the understanding of going, hey, this has been hard. Can I tell you that it's hard But God didn't give you cancer. God didn't make you lose your job. God didn't make you do that because he doesn't love you. He didn't do that because he's mad at you. It's because we live in a hurting and broken world. So your identity isn't what's happening to you through 2020. Your identity is how you respond in 2020. Will your response be one of holiness and righteousness, using it as an opportunity despite the hills, despite the storm, despite the valleys? Or is it, you know what, I'm having a pity party. You know what, woe is me. God must not like me. All this bad stuff keeps happening to me. We can point to Hebrews 11 and see bad things happen to good people. Doesn't mean God doesn't love us. We know God loves us, why? Because he sent Christ to redeem us and rescue us. And so where are you at in that journey? Because Daniel and his friends saw this as an opportunity to point others to the Lord. If we're gonna thrive in Babylon, we're gonna have to have hope. We're gonna have to have wisdom. We're gonna have humility and we're gonna have to have courage. We've got to have the courage to tell people why we are different, why we stand out, why we stand up. And so we move forward in that. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, we would love to begin to have that conversation going, hey, this is what it looks like to give your life to him. This is what it looks like, why your life should look different. Here's what it looked like at Capstone to make decisions differently because of Jesus. That's it, yeah. If you begin to go, okay, how is my life different? Not because I go to church, not because I have a big Bible, but how is my life different because Jesus is in my life? And I'm asking King Jesus, okay, how do I respond? I know I can't control what happens to me, but I can control my response and how people look at me and ultimately see you in me. So, so that's our story. 
Next week, uh, I'm, I'm done with my part. I, I've, I've, we spent six weeks on this. Next week, we're going to have um, Sarah Ellen leading our Capstone, uh, what we call table talks. And so we're going to have four people sharing what they've learned throughout this series. And you get to learn from them, not just a talking head. And ultimately, church shouldn't be just a talking head. And you learn from one person. It's the idea that we learn from each other. And so hopefully next week, you guys will be here and you're going to hear from three people going, hey, here's what I learned. Here's, here's, what, I'm gonna, here's what God said. Here's what I'm going to do about it. And you're going, man, that's not what I learned, but that's really good. Or man, I learned the exact same thing. And the idea that we're learning from each other throughout, and it's not these series, but we're doing Bible studies together and we're spending time together as a community. That's what it means to be the church. Not just mark something off on Sunday, but to learn from each other, grow from each other, sometimes from our mistakes, sometimes learning from our wins. And so hopefully you'll be for that. And then in November, we're going to start a marriage series. We're going to do three weeks just talking about relationships and how hard this has been and, and just giving you some tools and understanding scripture of the purpose of marriage and what that looks like. That is not about your happiness, but, but marriage is about your holiness and how that looks in your marriage. So if you know someone who's struggling right now, invite them to come first that first weekend in November uh, and that'll lead us up into Advent. So I'm excited about what God's doing. Great to see such, again, just a great crowd here. Um, and we believe God's at work. God's, God's using our online ministry. And we know there are a lot of people who are watching there. Uh, we know all, all, you guys are watching on the app. You guys are using that tool in a great way. And so thank you guys for just, as we kind of go through this pandemic, we're learning, living, and worshiping in a pandemic, but God is using this even now for his kingdom and his glory. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you that today, <laughs> courage is not about us being strong enough. It's about us leaning on you because you are strong enough. That God, you are, that you've done the hard work, that you literally faced Satan's sin and death and you punched him in the mouth. And God, that you defeated them. And so God, that gives us the courage. God, that gives us the strength. God, that gives us to know that it's not about us being good enough, but you have already been good enough, that you were the perfect sacrifice. And because of that, now that we have a family, that we were once orphans and now we have a father, that we were once homeless and now we have a home, that, that God, that we were once immigrants without a home of our own as a nation, and now we're part of the family of God and the nation of Israel. So Lord, I just pray, God, if there's someone here who is struggling, if they're hurting, God, if they're full of fear right now, God, that you would give them just the spirit of, of power. God, that you would give them the spirit of to be courageous and strong. That God, there are those right now who maybe don't even know you, that they would take those first steps. And they would simply say, God, I'm a sinner in need of a savior and I need you. God, if there are those who are, who are hurting right now and don't really know the steps to take, that they would reach out to me or other uh, members of leadership here at Capstone. And they begin to say, hey, hey, I just need to send an email to get some help. Or, hey, I need to have coffee to begin to say, hey, what does this look like in my life? Because I want the, the courage of Daniel. I want the humility of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God, I, I want the wisdom and the discernment that these men have in these days of uncertainty. So God, I just pray that we work together, that none of us are strong enough to do this by ourselves. First and foremost, we need your Holy Spirit. Second, we need community. We need to learn from each other. Next week, so encouraged by, by the message that's gonna come from just, just plain people who are just learning together. So God, I pray for our city that revival will come. God, I pray for the families that are in this place right now and those who are watching online. God, that we would begin to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and the hope of Christ. That we would no longer be conformed to the ways of this world. And people would see that. They'd be drawn to you by what they see, by the humility, by the wisdom, by the hope that we have in you. It's just holy to pray. Amen. We are so glad that you chose to join us this morning online to worship with our Capstone family. Today's big idea was Christian courage isn't about making a point. It's about responding in a way that points others to King Jesus. Right now, you might be full of fear and anxiety with all that is going on in the world. In our modern day Babylon, the courage to wake up, die to ourselves, and live for Jesus is the greatest response we can have to point others to Christ. What does courage look like for you? To forgive, to love, to serve, or maybe, like Daniel, to pray even for your enemies. If you would like more follow-up questions and scripture to study from this week's message, make sure to click on Digital Discipleship and Gathering Insights to learn more. Again, thanks for watching online. 
We would love to connect with you. You can connect with us on our social media platforms or our website at www.capstonechurch.net or we would love to see you in person in one of our future gatherings. You guys are sent out.